everybody. So real quick, I'm going to clear up a couple things from my previous video. In the beginning, <laughs> I was going to talk about the capacity for people to wildly misinterpret what the, the, the very little they may have come to understand about some natural phenomenon. And I was talking about Hymenoptera, and there's a couple of things I want to go back to in that discussion. Um, just to be clear, Hymenoptera are the bees, ants, and wasps, social insects, and I've learned astonishing things from watching them. And one of the most important things I've learned is that, first of all, they represent superorganisms in E.O. Wilson's terms. And there's a great book by him on that topic. He's a genius. I love this guy. Um, he's taught me so much. Him and uh, his uh, colleague, Hall Dobler, who've written The Social Insects, The Ants, The Superorganism. All these books are fabulous. And though I've studied uh, Hymenoptera personally in a very intimate way throughout my life, <laughs> occasionally by having the crap stung out of me, um, I could never have hoped to have learned many of the things that they've become aware of. Now, of course, some of their knowledge came with a price. Um, science <clears throat> studies, quote-unquote studies, phenomenon often by dissecting it. Um, I had more than one friend who wanted to be a biologist, and when they realized, or even an ocean, you know, a marine biologist, when they realized a good portion of their work was likely to be killing and dissecting creatures from the ocean, they were just, this is ridiculous, which is good, right? They realized that obliterating something isn't the same as studying it. To study a thing with integrity, I believe, it generally means to have an intimate co-beneficial relationship with it. And I'll come back to that in a minute because I'm, I'm in danger of losing my point, as I did yesterday. So I made a couple of statements. One of them was, you know, the hymen refers to the, what we call in colloquial terms, a woman's maidenhead. And um, it's something that's often, but not always, um, penetrated or pierced or torn permanently uh, when a woman first has intercourse. Now, of course, and I said, and I hope that many of those events are consensual. I would want them to all be consensual if, if that's how um, a woman's uh, hymen is, is penetrated. Um, but many women uh, who are, you know, who ride horses or um, engage in gym gymnastics or possibly through other means, uh, their, their hymen is penetrated in some other method that doesn't imply they were, you know, raped, or even that they're no longer, quote unquote, a virgin, in the sense of never having had inter intercourse. So I just wanted to clear that up real quick. <laughs> Delicate topic, no pun intended. Um, and then the other thing was, I was about to tell a story from the news feed, and it's funny, I think I may actually remember the book in question. A friend of mine was claiming that a book she had read uh, ha about the about it was sort of anthropomorphizing the bees um, wildly celebrated the the male bees which <laughs> for anyone who knows anything about bees um, the male bees have a, a kind of a complex existence right they um, <laughs> on the one hand they get pretty much taken care of without as humans think of it without having to do any significant work, right? They are fed and coddled until the day that they fly in the mating flight, um, after which they are roundly ejected from the hive and become prey for predators or just die because they're no longer being fed. So in this book, there was this wild scene where the females were making a living staircase out of their body to welcome the arrival of a male back from flight and blah, 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 blah. And it was just insane because obviously the person who wrote this book knew <laughs> very little both about bees and about the way the sort of, if I've got this right, the haplodiplo 
aspect of bee biology works. And of course, being a bee is a really kind of a strange thing because it's, um, it's like the pedigree. It's pedigree oriented, their genetics. So <clears throat> there's the soma and the genome, right? And, and the bees are the soma and the queen represents the genome. They're all her, her genetic children. And this takes different forms in different um, families or clades of Hymenoptera. Uh, for example, uh, yellow jacket queens battle. Um, uh, paper wasp queens, they battle um, around just shortly after ne uh, nest founding. And the winner becomes, undergoes metabolic changes and becomes fertile, and her children will eat the eggs of all the other queens. And so what you're seeing when you see a wasp nest, <laughs> or also the queens can overwinter, right? Whereas the rest, of the, the rest of the hive dies. When you see a wasp nest, you're seeing the living instance of a vast, unimaginable history of combats in those creatures who uh, display this biological framework. You're seeing something that goes back perhaps millions of years, right? You're seeing the living face of warrior queens going back millions of years. And if you think there's nothing interesting about that, I'm going to have to wonder um, about how you uh, arrive at the quality of interesting. But I'm also going to understand that each human being's scope of interests are going to be naturally unique both to who they are and to their, their history, their relationships, the contexts they are in. And this is so often forgotten when we try to judge or evaluate a phenomenon, we, we, the fictional we, um, judges and evaluators are often inclined to suspect that qualities are implicit in individual organisms rather than being emergent from histories and contexts. And in most cases, there's gonna be a little bit of both, but the latter one is often dismissed. And so it's very difficult for some of us to understand how people can hold, how specific people can hold uh, ideas or opinions or, or feel militant about subjects that we find to be either grossly misfounded or um, the unfortunate result of having been kind of weaponized against people in general and, and the specific people who take them up and circulate them like a disease. Uh, now, of course, part of the real problem around this in the current moment is, and I, and I wanna, I'm gonna go back to study, I'm just bookmarking that for myself. Part of the problem in the current moment is that there's this idea of a we, and I talk about this very often, it's, it's one of my pet issues. Um, if you and I have agreed, and in a sense, if you're watching this video, that has happened, right? Because I've um, done my part to try to produce material that I hope will be thought provoking and insightful and re you know, revelatory in the sense of revealing something that's difficult to otherwise see. And you've signed up for you know, the attention span that you're willing to devote. Thank you for doing so, whatever that, that span may be. Um, and so there's an agreement there, right? We, we've come to an agreement. And it's, it's relatively, uh, sig it's, it's, a, it's a significant agreement because each, you and I in our own ways, we've decided to devote some of our precious time. And hopefully the outcome is mutually beneficial and nourishing and we both learn Part of what's happening when I make these videos is not that I am just 
um, regurgitating ideas and information I have already digested. Right? Part of, this is part of my process of learning and understanding. And when I don't have near at hand um, people who I consider relatively intelligent with whom to have discussions like this, I have them with an imaginary friend. And if you're watching this video, you, are, you have chosen, and again, thank you for being so patient in doing so, you've chosen to embody that imaginary friend. And I make these videos in the hope that people who make that choice will find it rewarding and that we can learn together. Even though we may not have an actual conversation and a lot of what's going on here is one-sided in the sense that the guy who you know has the voice in this relationship for the moment uh, is me right so you're listening to my voice and hopefully my voice is pleasing and encouraging and reassuring and you know it'll occasionally <laughs> veer to other qualities but but I'm hopeful that uh, together we can forge and enjoy new ground above and beyond what we might otherwise have access to apart, right? And that's, that's mutuality. Now it's a weird kind of mutuality in the electronic age where I'm speaking and you're watching, right? And part of the problem in our, in our modern contexts, and many of them anyway, <clears throat> is our common experience and the contexts to which we are exposed and by which we can become compelled. Sorry, something was uh, checking me out there for a moment. <clears throat> a flying insect, possibly hymenopteran. Um, these contexts are, by and large, they are degrading. They are um, stupidifying. Uh, we get dumber every time we touch them. Our relationship with machines is primarily of this form. Um, in case that's not clear, I'll just give an example. You know, if you, if you used to ride a horse, you were intimately engaged with a living being who, there's probably no reasonable justification for it to be your slave. <laughs> and just because you're intelligent enough to enslave it doesn't give you the right to do so. But you were on a living being in a living context. The horse had senses about the context that you don't have, right? And so the horse became a kind of satellite intelligence that would contribute to your, um, your, your sensory relationships with the environments through which you were passing. And much like having a dog, um, cats are a little less common, though some people do take cats for walks. Uh, and I have done so myself. I've gone on walks with cats many times and enjoyed it immensely. When you have a satellite intelligence with, with extra senses, astonishing things happen. Your sensorium is extended dramatically. And to the degree you're willing to pay attention, it can be so dramatic that you might as well comprise a different species. Let me give you an example. The idea of a single uh, female human being in the wilderness. I'm just picking a, a female at random. I'm selecting a gender at random from the, you know, from the pool. <laughs> I guess modernly we consider it to be a pool rather than a dichotomy. In any case, or there's that we again, right? What, what, what we am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a kind of weird public sociocultural we that actually doesn't really exist and probably hasn't made the agreements it's supposed to have made. And this is part of the point that I'm, that I'm heading toward here. Uh, but let's take a female in the wilderness, deep in the wilderness. Um, without a dog, and in some other deep wilderness, we'll put a dog that's deeply bonded with a female in the wilderness. And what anyone who's paying attention should realize immediately is the female in, in the wilderness by herself, no matter how adept her senses are, she's no match for the, the female with a, a well-bonded canine at her side. And there's all kinds of reasons for that not merely scent, which is an extension of taste, um, which also extends to our skin surfaces, by the way, as I was reminded by one of my readers the other day. The, the, the female with, with the canine 
might as well be another species. Her capacity, if she, again, if she's paying attention and cares, her capacity to notice uh, situations, opportunities, threats, phenomenon, possible relationships in her environment is so radically extended beyond that of the woman without the dog that she might as well be a different species. Now, many of us in our minds, we have developed things that resemble the relationship between the female equipped, uh, <laughs> excuse me, the dog equipped female, I was gonna say the female equipped dog, but that works too. The dog is absolutely aware that the female has a sensorium different from its own. And one of the places in which they differ is that the female is a representational cognitive, a formally representational cognitive. It uses language, it has categories. Um, it has an entirely different way of being in the world than, than an ordinary animal has. Now there may be creatures, um, we might imagine them to include such creatures as gorillas, uh, orcas, whales, dolphins, chimps, um, prairie dogs, another matriarchal society there, prairie dogs by the way, um, and a really intelligent one. There's a great example of a, of a mammalian society where the females clearly have, or often at least have, um, a dominant leadership role in the society. Um, and they use, so they use each other's senses, right? So they magnify information by, by group sensing, yeah? Each unique individual creature contributing to the whole. But as I was saying earlier, both the dog and the female who has one, or the, the dog who has a female, however we want to we wanna see that, they're going to have opportunities for sensing, relation, threat detection, you know, opportunity, understanding, discovery, um, that, the un, that the female by herself will never, never have, no matter how intelligent she is, right? They're simp we're simply better off together um, in general. Now, the price, there's a little price to pay, they need to ensure they both can eat, they're both properly sheltered, and they are both relatively, you know, remain relatively healthy. And this is the place where the female has a weird um, advantage over the dog in the sense that although the dog might be able to kill and bring food to an injured female, a dog cannot set a broken limb, but a human can. And this is one of the really weird properties of the animal we are, and perhaps of our representational sentience. And it's one of the properties that is extolled in bizarre ways by religion, where humans are framed, and of course since religion was written, since the books of religions were written primarily by men, uh, men are extolled as, you know, the shepherds of nature. <clears throat> now. Apparently, according to the Bible, this is by divine decree. Um, I don't have to... I, I, I'm not required to either entertain or defeat that argument. Right? Um, I can do both. Yeah? I can say that whether or not there's any sort of intelligence involved in the origination of our species, and whether there was any intentional involvement of a non-human intelligence in the origination and... and evolutionary distinction of Homo sapiens sapiens, the only species that I know of that we stuttered on the word wisdom when naming, <laughs> important point. Um, we, <laughs> whether or not there was, there was something that intended to create or embody an animal with the very bizarre, unusual capacities we have. I mean, if you just look at these animals, right? They're doing all kinds of weird things, and I'm doing an even weirder thing. I'm holding a machine in my hand that was built by a superorganism called a corporation, right? um, without which you couldn't build these machines. It's not possible, though in modern times, because the components are available, it's conceivable that an, that an individual human could build a smartphone. Um, without that being true, the chances of something like that happening are extremely slim. 
Not impossible, but very, very slim. And the chances that they could produce something as, as advanced as what I'm holding in my hand, which actually is a number of years old, um, is really, really slim. Negligible, let's call it that. So, <laughs> my first point is, without losing my train of thought here, humans have bizarre capacities in nature. And one of, there isn't really any other animal that could intentionally, in other words, by its intentional, sort of non-regularly biological behavior, could, could draw the entire history and future of life on Earth into crisis, but we can do that. Right? And similarly, there isn't any animal that I know of that can muchly aid another animal who is injured or sick. Um, now, that becomes more complex when we include the pharmacopoeia of nature, and we can notice, for example, that bees will seek certain mushrooms, such as the lion's mane when they're suffering from varroa, and the immune disorders that make them susceptible to that. Um, there is a sort of symbiotic uh, capacity within relationships to be helpful in cases of harm being, you know, having been suffered. But there isn't anything like a human being that can set a broken bone of another creature, nurse it back to health. Um, though some mammals can nurse the children of other creatures, and I've seen uh, giant crocodiles gently digging out the children of turtles, an animal that they sometimes eat, and carrying those babies in her mouth from the sand to the water. Now that's altruistic behavior. There's no, and people de generally don't, you know, they're not likely anyway, unless they're very observant and understand nature more deeply than is common. They're not going to expect crocodiles <laughs> um, to be altruistic. And even when they see it, you know, the, the biologists are likely to explain it away in some bizarre fashion that has nothing to do with altruism because it's just, it's, it's counterintuitive to the often flawed way we think about natural relations, relation, relations and organismal sen, you know, sentience and how reptiles are and things like this, for us to imagine <clears throat> that, for example, they have feelings, <laughs> but they do. Um, and that's the problem. Even insects have feelings. They may not have the luxury of regretting an injury that they suffer, but they are aware that they are injured and they suffer. They just don't have the luxury of regret. They don't have the luxury of nostalgia. Perhaps, we might imagine they don't. Though, in, more com in animals that we call more complex, this, uh, these capacities may, may obtain. So humans, we have this weird quality, which is we are the animal with the capacity to transform the course of evolution intentionally. That's a really bizarre capability for an animal to have. Um, we are the animal that is aware, to some degree, of evolution, <laughs> and that awareness has been very dangerous for us and for life on Earth. In fact, many of the things our species has become aware of are extremely fucking dangerous for us and everything else that ever lived and ever will live. And why would I say that ever lived, right? How can we be dangerous to things that are gone? Well, part of the answer to that, and it's not the only answer, um, what we know of quantum physics at present, which is still, to call it early days, would be a gross overstatement. What we know of quantum physics tells us that Particles that photons that haven't even been created yet can be entangled with photons in the past. And part of what this means is implies that we have a this is really interesting. We have a a negligible relationship with the dimensionality of time. <clears throat> we in Edward Abbott's Flatland he talks about creatures that live in a two-dimensional plane. 
and how weird it would be for them, how enlightening and shocking and bizarre, even supernatural it would be if creatures that lived in three or four dimensions were to intrude into their awareness, and how, for example, a sphere passing through their plane would look at first like a dot that grew to a circle, that got to a very wide circle, and then went back to a dot, right? Because as it passes through the plane, you're going to see uh, cross-sections of the sphere, right? And they would wonder, what the hell is that? Although to them, it would just look like a dot that extends into a line and then comes back to a dot, right? Because they can't tell there's a sphere there. They can only see lines. They live in line land, so to speak. Well, in two dimensions, something passing through that plane will, will look like a line. So we're in this weird relationship with time where it appears linear to us and it appears monodirectionally linear. It only goes forward, but it doesn't. And um, there's another feature of our relationship with the history and future of life on Earth that we tend to overlook, which is that there is a purposive felt sense to being alive as an organism. And, and, and the luxury with which that felt sense has richness may depend upon complexity. However, in organisms like ourselves, which we consider to be singular organisms, yet we are not, I'm comprised of some 40 trillion cells, half of them bacterial, um, there's gazillions of viruses inside me, um, all kinds of, you know, all sorts of creatures evolved over time to produce animals like the one that I am. Um, what we do now changes the meaning of history such that if, as citizens of the United States, we do something absolutely horrific, then that shadow, at least for those people who are alive now, is cast backward over the entire history of our nation, right? It acquires that flavor, if you will, that, that scent, that stink. Similarly, if we do something so amazing that it ennobles the entire history of mankind, then some of the things we have suffered in history, some of the things others have suffered, they won't be justified entirely, but they will be... How, what is the word that I want here? And some of you already know it. If only you were here with my mind, helping me to think. Um, their meaning, the meaning of, of historical suffering and injustice and tragedy can be transformed when in modern times we do something so amazing and humane and noble and beautiful and intelligent that, that if our ancestors were present with us, they would all breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, it was worth it. Look at the beautiful things our progeny have done. Look at this wonderful thing. And it's not just true of humans. Um, all, you know, animal mothers want something, even like the mothers of rattlesnakes, right? Which, which are reptiles that give live birth. Many people aren't aware of this. Um, their eggs hatch inside them. They give birth to live babies. Uh, they, they, they have a natural sense of the desire for their children to succeed and to prosper in, in the, when whatever sense it's possible for that kind of organism. And this is natural to all, you know, all living creatures to, to widely varying degrees, right? The, the complexity adds depth and scope. And as we are so complex and so well endowed that we have conscious minds with which we represent reality and we have language and music and art and technology and all these things. It's particularly true of us, right? But it's, it's true of everything. So if we really fuck up as a species right now, the entire history of life on Earth can be, can be injured, can be harmed, can be lost, can be shown to have been in vain, in, in a sense, right? Now this is a much more complex idea because it, it supposes that the meanings of ancestral organisms, the meanings of their lives, are changed by what happens today. And, and that's a proposition that I'm going to leave on the table those of you who wish to contend with it are welcome to do so, and I will listen to your contentions. But to me, it seems natural that this is so. So, 
Our species has, in fact, the bizarre and fascinating capacity to shepherd, although, you know, that word is, is slightly suspect, but it, it conveys the, the gist, to shepherd the evolution or dissolution of life on Earth, right? To enhance and protect the unimaginable endowments with which we have the great fortune to have been the recipients of or to obliterate them for the, the sake of little sheets of paper, abstractions of value, um, the, the capacity to build machines or wage war against each other and the environment. Yeah. And that's the way that things are going at the moment, circa, you know, June 24th, 2020. In general, our species is burning down the history and future of life on Earth. And it's not necessarily because any specific person wants to. It's primarily because our supercultures are totally unguided by ethos. They don't, they're not capable of caring, right? What, what motivates them is profit and power and domination, primarily. And some people would argue that that's a result of patriarchy. And I'm going to suggest that the actual roots lie far deeper than that, granting whatever degree of relevancy that idea may have. I'm pretty sure this is a great big quinoa plant, but I'm not positive. <laughs> so the we of our supercultures is largely unguided by morals or ethics. It's guided primarily by this weird kind of Darwinian, no, it's not the right word, this weird kind of pseudo-Darwinian efficacy problem where the thing that, that beats up the other things best wins. It's a bully. It's a bullying system. It's a piracy system. And I've discussed this in previous um, episodes, so I'm not going to go deeply into that here, but what I am going to suggest, and I still want to return to um, <laughs> the topic of study, but what I'm going to suggest is that it's unfortunate that, that our supercultures have this tendency to take on the shadows of what we understand about competition and what we understand about evolution, I'm going to proclaim is wildly primitive. This idea has only been around for maybe, you know, a hundred years or something. And our species knows very little about it and the ideas we have are largely the result of the perspectives we've taken and the perspectives we've taken have led us toward mechanism. And in a sort of mechanistic battle for supremacy, you know, fitness, right? The, the fitness of the, of the organism is the defining uh, factor in survival, propagation, um, development, and so on. And environments affect that developmental uh, process, that developmental timeline in various ways. Um, organisms can adapt uh, or they can also reach sort of homeostasis with environments. So that, for example, um, fruit flies subjected to various kinds of environmental change can adapt very quickly because their, their generational cycles are very fast. Yeah? A day or a few days or something like this. Um, elephants don't adapt as quickly because they live a long time. And so, like us, are subject to various problems such as cancer that generally require a relatively old organism to study. <laughs> now, here's where I want to, there's a couple of things I, I want to put on the table. So first of all, whether or not it was divinely decreed, our species is effectively the steward of life on Earth. And the reason that we are is because we have the capacity to either obliterate it or preserve it. Now, how could we preserve it? Well, there's lots of ways we could. Part of that would be like just not obliterating it, right? Um, but we have the potential to avert things like an asteroid strike that would wipe out 
all of the remaining anciently conserved organisms and ecologies of any significant complexity. And some will argue, well, that's just a natural process. It happens from time to time. Yeah, go ahead and argue that. Um, and, and surely if you're not, if you feel in no way connected to the, the biome, right? And you don't feel like, like its ancestors are your ancestors and its body is your body, then it all becomes an abstract question and you can just say, yeah, you know, the whole thing gets wiped out every once in a while, it's no big deal. Um, but that's a disembodied and kind of psychotic or even schizophrenic perspective. And unfortunately, that's the kind of perspective our supercultures and our corporations largely have, right? They just, they're gonna do as much damage as they possibly can get away with. And maybe more because they're not intelligent enough to know when they've done enough damage that the whole damn thing falls down. And we're in, in very great danger of that now. So like it or not, <laughs> whether it's a divine decree or an accident of evolutionary um, novelty, our species is the steward of life on Earth. It's a fact. Uh, and we should be aware in the same way that when someone's driving a car, they, they have to be aware, right, of that fact. So they can't just go around crashing it into things and making up stories about why that's okay. Um, which is something that our supercultures and corporations absolutely do. In fact, we don't even need supercultures. Our president is doing this kind of thing all day long, right? We don't need nature. We can frack and put oil wells and wipe out ecologies and destroy the Environmental Protection Agency, which wasn't exactly doing the greatest job anyway. Um, but at least there was some kind of buffer between corporate greed and the, the delicate remaining ecologies that depend on us to not destroy them let alone for protection. Uh, <laughs> all right. So there's two directions I, I still want to go in. The first is that for me, study tends to mean it has this sort of Hippocratic oath to it. First, do no harm, right? And that's a very noble motivation. That's a very noble principle. First, don't make it worse, right? Now, unfortunately, we're not really intelligent or aware enough generally as individuals or as a species to be able to fully live up to that ideal, however much we may take it to heart. And in fact, in my own life, I am only modestly good at living up to that ideal. And yet I hold it in great reverence. Right? So there's this really weird problem with what we call science where researchers around the world apparently believe that it's perfectly reasonable to torture or obliterate organisms, to imprison them and subject them to all kinds of bizarre environmental stress and psychological stress and physical agony and so on and so forth in order to gather information. And that seems to me to be ethically reprehensible. I have never agreed with that. Even when I was a child and I began to, I had a microscope as a child and I, I used to watch microorganisms. I was aware as I was observing them on, you know, on a slide with a, with a slip cover under the harsh light produced by the little bulb that creates the transmissive medium that enables microscopy at that, you know, at that level, that those creatures were dying so that I could observe them. And I have to tell you that um, some can, you know, feel free to accuse me of ignorance or, you know, anthropomorphism or whatever you want, whatever accusations feel appropriate. Um, some people could say, well, they're just microorganisms. They don't, they don't feel pain. And yet microorganisms are both philic and phobic, which means they avoid some sensations. I think there's a pipe vine swallowtail. And they seek other sensations. And that means that whether or not they can feel the thing that we specifically refer to as pain, they know the physical experience of discomfort. And I felt great guilt that in order, and I still do to this day, if I, if I use my microscope, I try to return the organisms to the environment I retrieved them from without killing them. 
And people will say like, oh, you know, you're, you're a man who um, shoots horses and saves gnats, right? <laughs> and I might have to agree, for I am an omnivore. I eat meat. Um, and people can say, well, like, if, you know, there's a conflict there, there's hypocrisy there. Let me explain something about being human to these people, to everyone. And again, you know, I'm, I'm open to correction. I don't believe that I understand. I'm trying to understand. To be human is to be conflicted fundamentally. Our hemispheres are, are absolutely, not absolutely, they're, they're intimately conflicting aspects, intimately conflicting ways of being in consciousness, in the body, in the world. It doesn't mean they have nothing in common. It means they have lots of conflicting stuff that stands between them. And this is part of why we have the story in the Bible of Cain and Abel. This is part of why Ian McGilchrist wrote the incredible book. I'm so grateful that he wrote The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of Western Civilization, if I've got the subtitle right. Um, to be human is to be conflicted. We're going to experience conflict. And some of it's going to be subtly hip hypocritical and some of it's going to be catastrophically hypocritical. None of us are perfect. And yet we can learn to follow the inspirations and senses and feelings and observations that we find most noble toward higher ground, toward uh, developmental efflorescence, right? Toward understanding, toward insight, toward intelligence, toward compassion, toward prodigy. And this, I say, is our imperative. And so, with this in mind, I can at the same time declare I eat meat and I rescue insects from my home and take them outside. Even mosquitoes, <laughs> which I used to obliterate with relish a long time ago, and I don't mean the condiment. <laughs> um, so for me, study implies intimate relation with it implies a bonding like that of the female that I, the, 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 the um, theoretical female with her dog in the, in the wilderness. Um, it implies a, a unification of pasts, presents, and possible futures. And therefore, I do not want to kill to study, and I'm highly suspicious of any knowledge discipline that is completely willing to do so with wild abandon the way modern and relatively recent historical research, quote unquote, um, appears to be inclined. Now that isn't to say that all researchers are that way. There are people um, like Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey, who, let's face it, they probably, um, it, it'd be hard to say they brought no misfortune on the subjects of their study, but this, these uh, amazing women who were role models for me, like Jacques Cousteau and um, the guy who runs uh, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and other great naturalists. Um, they were reaching out a symbiotic hand toward the life forms they studied. And that to me is beautiful. Um, that to me is noble. Uh, but the idea that um, in search of information we're completely entitled to torture or obliterate uh, the organisms whose secrets we wish to wrest from their biology is insane and deadly. It's just wrong. And part of why it's wrong is that from my perspective, life on Earth forms a unity and it's not just a unity with terrestrial life, it's a unity with all of life in all of time and space. So we can't do harm, you know, my pinky shouldn't attack my hand, my hand shouldn't attack my arm, my arm shouldn't attack my body, and my body shouldn't attack my mind, you know, especially for purposes of trying to wrest information from my own biology. Uh, now, some could argue, well, I mean, there's lots of arguments against this, right? Like, where would biology be if we didn't do dissection? You know, what would we know? Would we even know about the existence of cells? Um, how would we be able to uh, have health care if we couldn't draw blood samples? 
yes, these are extreme possibilities for you know disagreement, and I'm not an absolutist. What I'm saying is, <clears throat> as a guideline, right? We should be aware. We should have reverence for for the ecologies and living beings, and for the ancestral beings whose progeny they are, and for the beings of the future who are the ancestors of ourselves and life on Earth. And with that reverence, we may occasionally make decisions that are inelegant and perhaps even ignoble um, out of some felt sense of necessity. But we should be guided by the sense that what we harm without will be harmed within. And thus guided, I think we're less likely to make the kinds of catastrophic mistakes that are relatively common in the research activities of our superculture, the organs of our superculture, right? Academia and corporate science and so on and so forth. But we have this other problem. It's a oh, we. I keep, I keep, this word we keeps dragging me like a black hole back to my desire to disambiguate it and continually remind us all that there is no we until we make an agreement to form one. And the victim we, or the arbitrary collective we, we Americans, right? Or we poor people, right? Um, those are both examples. Those are figures of speech. They're not actual we's. Like they can't guide themselves or correct themselves. They don't tend to learn. Um, they're not likely to forge intelligent agreements or anything like that. And if a group of people believes they, they form a we, like we the American people, then they will be confused when that we fails to act intelligently on matters of great import. But there is no we Americans. What we have is an ever more fragmented uh, library of factions often conflicting over minutia or nonsense or even just things that would need an upgrade to be thought of as nonsense. So that whole idea of we is wrong. And part of the reason that we're, <laughs> that us humans, <laughs> us modern humans, are facing so many problems is because we suppose that there is a we that is intelligently acting and thinking and making decisions when that's not even vaguely the case. And in fact, if anything is the case, it's that the opposite is true. There's an anti-we. <laughs> There's a non-us. And that non-us is often composed of the disembodied, meaning they don't have bodies, right? Organs of corporations, supercultures, and we groups that hide, like the Bilderbergs and the Trilateral Commission and, and the elite wealthy of the world that are primarily farming everything else so that in a single lifetime they can accrue more wealth than was possible for any, for, for, for like the entire history of mankind a thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, so this kind of nonsense has been going on for quite some time now, but it's become particularly virulent and common in our time. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hidden we in the background, sort of puppeteering the rest of of, of um, mankind and the world. And this is part of why us modern people are subject to conspiracy theories because we sense that something has gone fundamentally wrong. Um, that the, the motivations and activities of the corporations and supercultures have become lethally toxic and rapacious and vicious, not that they ever really weren't. Uh, but now, you know, the history and future of life on Earth hangs in the balance. And if a move is not made to intervene very, very quickly, we're going to become, sorry about the wind here, the instigators and inheritors of a cascade of catastrophes unlike anything ever seen in the history of life on Earth or mankind. 
So us modern humans, trying to avoid saying we <laughs> in a sneaky way, <laughs> have to forge intelligent collectives. We have to learn how to do this. We need to do it yesterday. We need to do it 20 years ago, 50 years ago. But we absolutely have to do it tomorrow. And if we don't, then the history and future of mankind and all of life is very likely to be sacrificed on the altar of the bizarre, <laughs> mechanically rapacious ravages of modern commercial superculture, the prison, the prison military industrial complex, so on and so forth. And in fact, some of the, what underlies this is nothing more sophisticated than the language that we use, right? It's this we in our language that's so deceptive. And we believe, well, us modern humans, are inclined to believe that science is relatively noble. And it, it's not. Unless we are noble with what we do with science, science is not intrinsically noble. There's nothing intrinsically noble about it. There's this idea that, well, it lifted us up from superstition. Yes, well, it also lifted us up from intimate relationships with the environments with which and for which and, and of which, you know, we arise. <laughs> right? So, you know, the idea that science like rebonds us to the earth is insane. I mean, it's not that it couldn't, but it doesn't. <laughs> I notice suddenly as I pause that I've been doing this, this slightly Italian thing and I, I am slightly Italian <laughs> of ranting, which I got in trouble for the other day. A close friend who I've been friends for, with for many years and uh, who I love a lot. He's kind of a crazy guy, but he's very smart. Um, and he likes to rant too. Uh, he took offense at one of my rants and sort of cut me off. And perhaps he and I will not speak again, though I hope that's not the case. Um, but my rant was relatively innocent and fairly short-lived, and he should have at least asked me a question <laughs> or interrupted me and just said, hey, what's going on over there, right? As any friendly person might. So we have this other problem, which is that simulations of intelligence aren't intelligent. Simulations of symbiosis aren't symbiotic. Um, simulations of learning don't learn, <laughs> right? And the problem that I'm going to point at here is that there's a disease rampant in our modern human social contexts, and it's the disease of news. It's an informational disease. And if you imagine that all of the human minds on Earth comprise a network, and that network comprises something analogous to an ecology, and that in that ecology there are transports between groups and individuals, which of course all of these things are reasonably easy to suppose, at least for the sake of a model. So I'm going to call the network the cognition, and I'm going to call the transports the mimula. And that includes things that are visible and invisible, right? Things that are tangible and intangible. The internet is probably the most significant physical layer <laughs> of a manipulable, a human manipulable aspect of the mimula. But there are many other layers and some of them are probably, if they're not so weird, as to qualify as supernatural, a word that I like to um, avoid because I think that everything that's in nature is natural. There's just, there, but there is spooky stuff that's natural. Um, there are layers that are non-ordinary. That's a word I prefer. There are layers to the mimula that are non-ordinary. And I strongly suspect that the idea of angels and demons is related to the human mimula and what motivates it and shapes it and instructs its development or devolution. Um, <laughs> complex topic that I'm not going to go into today, but in the mimula, um, in this model, 
there exists something that I refer to as thrisps. And these are not merely memes. They are the analog of warlike organisms that compete for dominance of the terrain of human consciousness. And they have intention. They intend to dominate the, the cognitium and they intend to dominate the mimula. And what they compete for is dominance, dominance of transports within the mimula, dominance of specific humans and groups, which they see as reproductive organs. Um, and the process is quite terrifying if one were to have a direct way of looking at it from above rather than looking at it through it, which is sort of how we are. In this sense, we live in flatland, right? We can't see the cognitium and the mimula and the thrisps from above. We actually use the cognitium and the mimula and thrisps to see with. And once converted by various thrisps, we become their agents and thus we view others who do not carry the same and, and promote the same thrisps that have dominated us. We view them as other and we are inclined to attack them. Now, this is just a model. It's a toy. It's something we can use. I'm not saying this is how it is. I'm saying this is what it's like, right? I'm saying this likeness is very powerful to use, to see into processes and situations that are otherwise invisible to us and very difficult for us to contact. And unfortunately, what's going on now is there's a rapid, I'm not going to use the word evolutionary. I think, I think people wrongly equate evolution with development. Evolution isn't development. Evolution is modulation toward fitness with contexts. Very, very important distinction. If you just learn that one thing, we will have succeeded wildly today. And part of that means that if you're in a really crappy, low-grade context, and you evolve for fitness in that context, that doesn't mean you're really necessarily have succeeded or even developed. It just means you've acquired fitness with a context that's toxic or degrading or, you know, ignoble, dehumanizing, right? Um, and most of the contexts produced and promulgated by our supercultures are of this kind. They are degrading. Um, they are inhuman. With some few exceptions. So what's been going on lately is there's been this rapid upsurge in extremely toxic, virulent, weaponized I can't not call it information, but usually when I use the word information, I mean something that's relatively veritable, right? Something that's actually related to the subjects from which and, f and, and the purposes for which we derive it. And <clears throat> information is such a general term that it may be the wrong one to use. I may need to sharpen my vocabulary here, but for the moment, I'm going to stick with it. We are... Um, due to the current economic and um, epidemiological and socio-political environment, us modern humans, that's what I mean by we, <laughs> but I might also mean particular groups of us. Um, certainly, I belong to a privileged group. There's no doubt of that. Um, and there are a number of different ways to frame my privilege, but one of them is just the fact that I'm, I'm able to do what I'm doing right now. I have the leisure and the technology to record this video, and I have the intellectual luxury of having developed a mind rich and sophisticated and curious and passionate enough to endow me with this capacity for something resembling flight. Um, I can often fly far above the contexts in which I might otherwise be stuck and enmeshed and degraded and, and tortured. And it isn't that I haven't suffered. I, I have. Um, 
It's just that the portion of suffering that has accrued to me is minimal enough that it didn't yet, it hasn't yet silenced me. Yeah. So I, I have the privilege of, of being able to have this opportunity to opine on matters that I that are near and dear to my heart and my concern. And primarily my concern is not for myself, although I'm self-concerned enough that I wish to survive in, in relative comfort and so on. Um, it is for life on earth and for the children of mankind. Um, my hope is to lessen their suffering and give them perspectives that will allow them to develop in ways that the context in which they will ordinarily find themselves would not only prohibit, but might punish. So, so we're in this situation now where we're seeing a degree of informational warfare in, you know, using the electronic mimula particularly, um, or the electronic layer of the mimula, in, a, in, a, in an effort to convert large populations that comprise the human cognizium into weapons. And the primary purpose for that is domination, subjugation, and getting essentially people to attack each other. And the reason why that's useful is that the disembodied sort of psychotic supercultures described by Ian McGilchrist in The Master and His Emissary and first hinted at by ancient stories like Cain and Abel, um, where Cain kills his brother, buries him, then lies to God about having done so. <laughs> um, by the way, that Cain guy, that's the father of the supercultures that, <laughs> the, the disembodied supercultures, right? The sort of, it, one way of thinking about them is um, the uncorrected, overinflated left hemispheric aspects of our humanity, right? When I say left hemispheric, I mean, the left hemisphere of our corpus callosum, which has developed this incredible capacity for representational thought, abstraction, um, science, technology, and our supercultures are the shadow of that, right? There's nothing that corrects them. There's no right hemisphere that's embodied that comes along and goes like, hey, don't burn down the fucking Amazon rainforests. Don't rip the oceans themselves to shreds. Your hubris will kill everything if you do this. There's no, they're not correctable. We never established anything human or intelligent enough or um, empowered enough to have much of an effect at all on corporations and, and the activities of supercultures yet. And this I say we must do if we hope to survive in any meaningfully human form in a world that's worth living in. <clears throat> This thing here that I'm, I'm enmeshed in right now, <laughs> this is a real cognition. The human cognition has been taken over by its own projections, right? But this stuff around me, this grass, and you can say, well, the humans brought this grass. You can say whatever you want. This stuff is so old that the idea of time is ridiculous in comparison to it because it partakes of modes of time we have been too fucking timid to imagine, let alone contact. And so this, I feel like I'm in paradise right now. There are still trees and animals and insects here. Not as many as there should be, but some. I live in a time where I can still walk outside without a gas mask and an oxygen tank. And, you know, this is an unimaginable privilege to be alive in this moment. And it's also a privilege to be alive in this moment because of the crises we're facing. This is the time when a single beautiful gesture might mean more than it ever did in history. So if we can manage to do something amazing together now, we will have succeeded at a task so astonishing and beautiful that we will ennoble the entire history of life on earth. And this is my hope and my dream. But at the moment, <laughs> the dark forces have, have surged to incredible primacy. Now, it may be that their own hubris will be their undoing. I just don't want them to take the entire biosphere and the history and future of life on, on Earth and mankind with them. And so it is for this reason that I, I make these little, <laughs> these little videos and 
conversations in the hope of it in the hope of providing perspectives awareness and understanding about features of our situation that will give us the opportunity to overcome it rather than to remain as we have for so long almost entirely subject to it and if you share that vision then we are in agreement and that's a we I trust and value respect and have reverence for. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye for now.